So I wanted to introduce Ken Ames. Uh, he's going to be our speaker um, this afternoon. Uh, he's uh, the chair of the anthropology department at Portland State University, and he's been there since 1984. And a lot of his work focuses on the Portland Basin. I was telling um, the previous audience that uh, if you're interested in archaeology of the Pacific Northwest or of the Portland Basin, you run into Ken Ames' name um, frequently. Uh, you'll also run into a lot of other names that all happen to belong to his students. So his influence um, and his importance to archaeology of this region is really um, both direct and indirect through, uh, through those students. Um, he's going to talk today about canoes and, uh, in fact, uh, give, give a lot of the sort of material um, culture aspect or, or importance, the context, um, the contextual importance of the carving demonstrations that you can see outside. Um, and I also want to mention that after this talk, he'll be heading over to a uh, women's canoe that the Maritime Museum has up and talking about that. So if you're interested in having somebody who knows a lot, who can tell you what you're looking at while you're looking at it, that's what he'll be doing after this. Well, thanks for coming. Um, and what I'll do, when I'm, it's a little different than what it says in the program. What I'm interested in talking about uh, are sort of the role and place of canoes in the economy and the culture of uh, people mainly along the lower river, but also along the, rest, the west coast. Um, so without further ado, and also want to thank Katie for inviting me and for organizing this. And I also want to acknowledge the Chinook tribe and my friends in the Chinook tribe, all of whom are out of the carving uh, tent. And I'm starting with this painting by Charles Russell on the Lewis and Clark expedition in Canterbury Chinook for the first time. And I really like this painting. Uh, it's I like it because. There is some nuggets of truth in it, even though the, the painting is really completely wrong. Um, uh, and for some reason, I love it for that reason. Uh, Lewis and Clark are in a, and also these folk who are supposed to be sure, are in some variety of uh, northern or central coast canoes. These guys are probably maybe Clinkett, uh from southeast Alaska, and but the sense of consternation in this canoe, in the Lewis and Clark canoe, as they meet people who are obviously good, you know, they've met other people who are good at managing their boats, but people who are extremely skilled with their boats, who uh, were familiar with Europeans, who were not particularly impressed with Lewis and Clark, though other native people along the river were not necessarily impressed with them either. Um, but there's a sense of sort of confidence and strength that Russell has given the people in this boat that I like in terms of uh, this encounter. Also, what it shows, the point that I made later, or later in the talk before, is that when Lewis and Clark were here, technologically, aside from guns and things like that, technology, this is just before, you know, 17, uh, 1805, 1806, this is just before the Industrial Revolution really gets underway. The technological difference between Euro-Americans and Native peoples wasn't all that great. There were more Euro Americans, there were farmers and things like that. The technological difference between the people in this canoe and the people in this canoe were all wasn't all that great. Uh, and I think that's something worth keeping in mind. Now this is a painting by Bill Holm, and there are paintings scattered through here that I put in because I was curious to see them on the screen. <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, so there's much of my own interests as they are for perhaps for you. But they also home and there's another set of paintings, they're painting some canoes, and I put them in in a sense to try to convey the canoes, the powers of the canoes, the way the canoes were used, uh, in ways that it's easier to do with images than it is to talk about, uh, or use old photographs or something like that. Most of these paintings are from the central and northern coast, you can see by the artwork. They're not the lower river, but despite that, the essence fits the lower river. Uh, so this is a group of uh, high up warriors. He's actually wearing a piece of hide armor that may have been exported from the lower Columbia up to the Queen Charlotte's. So anyway, 
If Lewis and Clark had encountered a large flotilla of plague warriors, uh, as in the Russell painting, this is probably what it would have looked like. Would have been, but they didn't. Rather, this is a painting by Christopher Hopkins of Lewis and Clark at a place called Catholic which is just downstream of, of, of Portland and uh, Vancouver. And it's a village, a town, where I've been spending the last 19 years as an archaeological site now uh, doing excavations and analysis. And I consulted on this painting. And uh, this is a very different picture of, of the encounter than the one in the, in the Russell painting. Here, here's the Lewis and Clark party here at the Chinook reading them, uh, talking about trade and other kinds of matters. This is the canoe that Lewis and Clark came down in, their cottonwood dugouts that they got from this first. And these are the local canoes. We'll see this painting again for the moment. Just to get a sense, this is probably, we really wanted to make sure that we convey the sense of the numbers of canoes. I did a study a number of years ago, and I, came, I figured that there was probably one canoe for every animal and child on the coast. So that's, so we'll come back to this, but that's the, what I want to convey in this picture. So, by two main themes, canoes were central to life on the river, both culturally and economically. Uh, and that this importance is unappreciated generally, except by the people themselves. And I suspect that one of the things, talking to a crowd in Astoria, that this may not be a message I really need to make um, in an area that is filled with boats, people grow up with boats, they're familiar with boats. So some of what I'm going to say may not seem all that stark, but in other circles it, it can be. This is a sculpture by the great high artist Bill Reed. This is the Black Canoe. It sits outside the Canadian Embassy in, in Washington, D.C. There's another green canoe, a green version of this, which is in the Vancouver Airport. And what Reed shows are all the major figures of Haida oral tradition and mythology encompassed in a canoe. And what this expresses is a sort of cultural point because the, you know, the, cult, the cultures of the coast are contained within and supported by their boats, both in terms of economy, and in this case, oral tradition and mythology. So the book, canoe is this very, very central, central tool. It's also a central image. And that's why, for example, we see on the coast now this revival of canoe building and canoe trips and canoe flotillas and things of that size. So it's a real identifier in culture. So turning to transportation, uh, again, living on the Columbia, looking out the window at all those big boats, it's going to come as no surprise. But uh, living in areas that are accessible by water, just having access to water transportation, as opposed to being in a terrestrial city where it's only or a place only accessible by land, has a significant impact on demography and other kinds of things. So Spolo did a study, a comparison of 327 European cities in the period from 1500 to 1800. And found that was what I'm calling aquatic cities, also you know, like Astoria, that are on a navigable river, or ones directly at the coast, a place like Seattle or Vancouver, and the equivalent of that in Europe, <laughs> grew faster and more consistently over that 300 year period. Their median population, the median is the right midpoint, high and low, was much larger than landlocked cities. Populations of landlocked cities were subject to sharp changes. They went up, but they went down. And they lost population during that 300 year period, four, yeah, 300 year period, whereas the ones on the ocean did not, the ones on navigable rivers in the ocean did not. Well, I was curious to see if some of this was applicable to uh, Western North America, native Western North America. So I took figures from a variety of sources. Most of this is from the late 18th and 19th centuries. And this is from California. And here, these are quite people like the Pomo, these are the Pomo, uh, who lived along lakes, but there are also people on rivers and on the coast. And these are people who are entirely terrestrial. They don't have access or much access to canoe transportation. You can see, well, there's some overlap. The really big ones are here. And this is the median. This is you know, the midpoint. And this is the mean or the average. And you can see that the median and the average for aquatic people is larger. These are people per, members of people per 100 square kilometers. So it gets up, it's quite large. These are some of the largest populations in native North America. 